and it's my honor to introduce to you Dr. Peter Satsmari, who assumed the combined position of Chief Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, as well as Director of the Division of Child and Youth Mental Health at the University of Toronto in March of 2013. <clears throat> I'm, sure as <clears throat> I'm sure as many of you know, uh, we stole him from uh, down the road at McMaster, where he had been before that. He has made many significant contributions to the field in many areas, including diagnosis, measurement and longitudinal development, all of which led to significant changes in our understanding of autism spectrum disorder, as well as a classification of ASD in both DSM-4 and 5. It is my pleasure to welcome to you Dr. Satsmeri to speak to us today. Thank you, Doug, and uh, thank you very much for that uh, uh, kind introduction. It's uh, uh, wonderful to be here today, and I'm very honored and thrilled to uh, be able to give this uh, presentation. I think the uh, working group on adults with autism, Kevin and Doug and, and uh, Pushpal and the rest of you have done a fantastic job in promoting the idea of supporting uh, and accommodating and thinking about the needs of adults with autism spectrum disorder, particularly in the context of their mental health. Um, uh, I also want to uh, take the opportunity to I thank Ms. Elliott for all the work that you've done. You really have been, uh, both you and your husband, uh, ex-husband, uh, have been uh, uh, really uh, remarkable advocates for kids with developmental disabilities. And I remember with Pushpal speaking at the uh, at special committee, and it was a great experience. And we, we really felt that we were uh, that we were heard. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. I mean, I remember uh, that if you wanted to have. Uh, conference on adults with uh, autism spectrum disorder, you might fill a table, right? You might get enough people around the table. So uh, to see that there's so many people uh, that are interested in this topic and, ha and see how important it is, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Okay, so what do you think? Green? You'd think green would go, no, okay, that's the laser. Be careful about that. No, the red one doesn't work. No, oh, it's that one. There we go, okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, potential conflicts of interest. I receive uh, grant funding from CIHR, from Genome Canada, from Autism Speaks, both the uh, ca Canadian uh, part of Autism Speaks and the US from NeuroDevNet and the Ontario Brain Institute. I receive royalties from Guildford Press, although they are diminishing rapidly as uh, the years go on, and I have no consultancy or pharmaceutical uh, uh, fees. So my learning objectives today is, uh, first of all, I want to introduce the concept of developmental health to the ASD community. This isn't a term that's used uh, widely, but I think it's a very helpful and useful term to bring our thoughts together on a and think about health in a composite, more holistic sort of way. Um, I want to help us understand the interaction of risk and resiliency in accounting for variation in developmental health in autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and I want uh, to appreciate what resiliency means for the developmental health of children and adolescents and adults with uh, ASD. And, you know, the fact that uh, the singing barista was just before me, couldn't have been a better introduction to the concept of resiliency. Uh, that was fantastic. And then I want to give examples of resiliency from the literature, and I'm going to briefly land on different examples of resiliency by talking about sex differences, genetics, findings from the baby sibs uh, studies, uh, and from prospective studies of autism spectrum disorder. So first of all, what is uh, developmental health? This is a, um, I'm gonna give you the punchline for the talk, uh, uh, basically. And the, the punchline is that developmental health of individuals with ASD is the result of a complex interaction between risk factors, such as rare genetic variants, and resiliency, or protective factors. 
and it is remarkable to me that resiliency is not discussed in the autism literature at all. There is not a single publication on the concept of resiliency within kids with ASD. Uh, and I think, however, that there are lessons we can learn from studying resiliency that can be of use to all individuals with ASD. Because the fundamental lesson to be learned is that resiliency is not the absence of a risk factor. Uh, that there are protective factors and that if we spend more time thinking about protective factors and studying protective factors that we can capitalize and leverage those protective factors to help all children uh, with ASD grow up to be productive uh, and uh, socially included adults. Okay, so first of all, what is developmental health? So developmental health is the ability of children to meet the developmental milestones um, associated with a particular developmental stage. This was a term that was developed by Clyde Hertzman, who was a friend and colleague, sadly passed away a couple of years ago, worked at, uh, uh, um, uh, was originally from Ontario, uh, uh, but went to work at UBC, and he primarily worked in the early childhood sector and termed the concept of developmental health as a way of encompassing all the different milestones that young children uh, need to meet, meet before they're ready to move on to the next developmental stage. And I think the concept of developmental health, although it was originally developed in the concept, uh, within the context of very young children, actually applies across the lifespan. We all have developmental health challenges. We're all trying to meet the milestones associated with our developmental stage. If I can figure out what developmental stage I'm in at this point in my life, I would sure like to know that. Uh, and I think it's very useful because it's an inclusive concept. It brings together all the different aspects of health and points out that they're related, that health is not a constellation of silos. So, <clears throat> so these are some of the developmental health outcomes that one can think about. Cognitive outcomes, physical health, emotional and behavioral regulation, pro-social behaviors, independence, school achievement, recreational skills, uh, and adaptive functioning, which I'm going to uh, bracket as socialization and communication <coughs> and daily living skills. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to make what I think is a fundamental and, and absolutely crucial distinction, and that is uh, that uh, <coughs> developmental health is independent of symptoms that one might have that's associated with a disorder. So developmental health could include the milestones, the challenges at each developmental stage that are associated with some of these different kinds of domains. So independence will look different if you're a preschooler than if you're an emerging adult. But it is a domain that stretches across the lifespan. Same with cognitive, physical health, um, et cetera. So resiliency in uh, ASD. So resiliency refers to individuals <coughs> who have, quote, better than expected outcomes in the face of adversity. Ver the adversity, there is quite a bit of literature on resiliency in the psychology literature, but usually the adversity is conceptualized in the context of some external adverse event. Could be a catastrophe, could be a hurricane, it could be war. People have extended the concept of adversity uh, to think of abuse, uh, mental illness in a parent, for example. But what if the adversity is the diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder. There's no reason, conceptual reason, why a developmental disability can't be an adversity just like some of those external adversities. So if you buy that argument, then resiliency then becomes a better than expected outcome given a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, or I'm gonna provide illustrations of having a risk factor for uh, ASD. So, and resiliency then is a reflection of both individual factors within the kid, uh, within the individual, but also contextual factors like an accommodating employer, for
for example, like an accommodating teacher, for example, like having uh, older siblings that can support you. So resiliency is not either or, either in the kid based on their IQ or language development or whatever. It's not only in the environment, it's a complex interaction between individual and contextual factors. <coughs> and as I've mentioned, um, PubMed or any of the other uh, literature sources that uh, you know, house all our literature on autism spectrum disorder, there's not a single article that has discussed resiliency within the context of kids with ASD. There are, there's discussion about parents being resilient in the face of having a child with ASD, but nothing discussed in terms of the kids themselves. And I think that is a serious mistake and something that we need to address. Okay, so I'm going to now, you know, if, I'm, if, 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 if uh, the developmental health of a kid is the interaction between risk factors and resiliency, I first need to talk a little bit about some of the risk factors that we know about in ASD. And uh, there's been an enormous explosion of research in this area in the last uh, 10, uh, 20 years, and I think we learn, we now know a lot more than we used to, and I think the best validated risk factors <coughs> for ASD that we know about are what, what are called familial risk factors. So we know, for example, that the disorder runs in families. We know that if there is uh, one child in the family that has an autism spectrum disorder, there's about a 20% risk that the next child in the family will also have an autism spectrum disorder. So that comes from what is what's known as the baby sib studies where uh, infants who have an older sibling with ASD are followed from birth to about three years of age and then later in order to see what percentage of them develop an autism spectrum disorder and what the pattern of that unfolding might be. So that 20% when it first came out was a bit of a shock. It was much larger than most people uh, had anticipated. There are some really good uh, community-wide population-based studies um, that are of better quality than uh, those that, used, that we used to have available. They suggest the sibling recurrence risk is 10%. Okay, fair enough. So we have these two figures, 10%, 20%. You know what, either way, 10% is still a substantial figure and requires, I think, uh, uh, universal monitoring of siblings of older children with ASD to see how many might develop the disorder. Some uh, other recent data that's come out is not only is it true that 20% from these baby sibling studies, not only is it true that 20% might have an autism spectrum disorder, but another 20% have other developmental challenges of one sort or another. That can refer to difficult temperament, delays in language, difficulties in emotional and behavioral regulation. We're not exactly sure what these other developmental challenges are going to look like. We don't know, maybe some kids will grow out of them. Uh, some kids might persist. They may develop into uh, emotional behavioral disorders like anxiety disorders or ADHD, we don't know because we've just sort of discovered this in the last four or five years. So the unaffected siblings of ASD, even though they might not develop ASD, it looks like about a fifth of them might develop other developmental challenges that require uh, continual surveillance as well. Probably the best known uh, risk factor uh, for uh, ASD is uh, male sex. So we know that boys are affected much more frequently than girls, about four to one. <clears throat> in clinic samples, if you go into community samples, the sex ratio is a little lower between two and three uh, to one. And we know that not only are girls uh, less uh, frequently uh, uh, um, affected by the disorder, but their phenotype is slightly different as, as well. But so sex becomes an important risk factor. We have no clue. It's like the weather. It's something everybody knows, but nobody uh, really understands. That is, nobody has, there's no clue as to why uh, boys are more frequently affected with ASD than uh, girls. 
And probably the most uh, significant uh, new knowledge in the last decade or so is the discovery that rare genetic variants account for an increasing number of cases with autism spectrum disorder. So given the background of those risk factors, I'm now going to give some examples of resiliency. And I'm going to talk a little bit about protective factors in girls. I'm going to talk about reduced penetrance of some of these inherited genetic variants I within families. I'm going to talk about the variable expression in siblings of kids with ASD. And I'm going to talk, give some examples of resilient outcomes in developmental health that are seen over time. And I'm going to kind of go through these different examples. So sex differences. So I've mentioned that girls outnumber boys by about four to one in clinic samples. But if you go and do if the, from some of the large epidemiologic community samples, the sex ratio is somewhat uh, reduced. Girls tend to have more severe cognitive impairment uh, than boys with ASD, <coughs> and they also tend to have more severe symptoms than boys with ASD. So it's almost as if, although girls are less frequently affected, they need a bigger load, they need a bigger etiologic load to push them over the threshold of having the disorder. Um, uh, and as a result of that increased etiologic load, they are more severely affected. That's one hypothesis that's been proposed. But you know what? There's some really important and interesting work coming out more recently that girls are less well recognized. So we don't tend to think of gir young girls or higher functioning girls with ASD. They don't fit our stereotypical pattern recognition as diagnosticians uh, with ASD. Girls, young girls, particularly those who are higher functioning and not cognitively impaired, have a different kind of presentation. So for example, they have fewer repetitive stereotyped behaviors. They tend to have better social skills than similarly affected by matching on IQ boys with ASD. So as a result, it looks like girls are more often at the threshold of the diagnosis and so as a result uh, sometimes get, uh, sometimes get uh, uh, missed. There's also some uh, interesting evidence that higher functioning girls look quite different. They can compensate, uh, for example, for their presentation and so there's this term that has been used, it's their ASD is camouflaged as a result. So they get missed as a, as a result of that. And I think this is a very important um, thing to be looking at and to try and understand that actually the sex ratio may be way more equal than we think it is, but what is it that's driving the different presentation in the girls? What are some of the biological, psychosocial factors that are leading to that? Uh, and if we start to think of some of these protective effects in girls, it becomes uh, potentially uh, quite Im important. And the whole study of protective factors in girls is just, uh, just starting. And this is where uh, some of the uh, interesting <coughs> data from uh, rare de novo and inherited genetic variants is uh, coming up. And I'm not going to get very technical about this. I'll try and uh, make it as uh, simple as possible because quite frankly, the genetics is now beginning to leave me behind. It's getting so technical and so sophisticated uh, 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 that I get lost uh, in the discussions and I sit there and I look intelligent, but I certainly don't feel it uh, inside. There are, have been sort of two different models of the genetic etiology for complex disorders. One has been the common variant, uh, common disease hypothesis. That is, that there are common genetic variants that are associated with common disorders like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. In autism, in the public health uh, point of view is a common disorder. It's not a rare disorder at all. Rare disorders are things like Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis. Those are rare disorders. Autism is a common disorder in the same ballpark as diabetes, so forth. 
So the, you, the, the natural hypothesis is that genetic variants that are common, that run commonly, that are uh, widely circulated within the population, might be associated with the disorder. Makes a lot of sense. Um, now this uh, hypothesis, however, has not been supported by now at least six or seven what are called genome-wide association studies, which are the most powerful design methodology for picking up common variants associated with a disorder. We were involved in one of these GWAS studies, and it was, uh, I must say, very disappointing to us that, you know, we had something like uh, 100,000 genetic markers all the way across the genome, and there wasn't really a single genetic marker that reached genome-wide statistical significance. And other people have now replicated that, so it really doesn't look like common genetic variants can account for much of the disorder. In other disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, they are turning up common genetic variants, but they need a sample size of upwards of 60, 100,000 individuals. Our studies in autism, at best we've got maybe 5,000 individuals. So we may not have a big enough sample size, but if you need 60,000 to get a statistical result, the, what's called the effect size or the impact of that common genetic variant is going to be very tiny. So the focus has moved away from common genetic variants to rare genetic variants that might have a bigger impact. And there's two kinds of rare genetic variants that people are looking at, so-called copy number variants that are uh, discovered by clinical microarray, which are now available clinically and are paid for uh, by OHIP, and sequence variants that are discovered by whole exome sequencing, that's the WES, sequencing and whole genome sequencing. These are two different ways of, um, of discovering sequence variants. So I don't know, I guess you've got pictures of my, of my slides, eh? So this is just an illustration of uh, what these different variants uh, might look like. If I use my, whoops, go back. Of course, my laser only goes there, doesn't it? You know, you can't see there where my laser is. So. Let's go to the left-hand side. Uh, this this uh, il diagram illustrates the different types of genetic variants that are available, that we know about. There are chromosomal variants, like Down syndrome, for example. Uh, <coughs> there are other kinds of chromosomes where big chunks of chromosomes uh, are um, disrupted in some significant way. They, we do see chromosomal variants in autism spectrum disorder. They tend to be quite rare. About 5% of cases of ASD will have a chromosomal variant in one way or another. You can see chromosomal variants with the electron microscope. And then we move over to the right to smaller genetic variants. In other words, they disrupt smaller stretches of DNA and that's what are called uh, copy number variants. I'll give you a better example of that. And then you move further to the right and smaller stretches of DNA are disrupted. Either a piece could be deleted or another piece of DNA could be duplicated and those very small segments of DNA that are disrupted in that way we call sequence variants and we can only see them through um, whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, the copy number variants we see by clinical microarrays. And we just sort of, you know, reported the first, uh, our group reported the first uh, copy number variant uh, in autism spectrum disorder um, about uh, 10 years ago. So this field has really exploded in the last decade. Okay, so what are copy number variants? So these are variations in DNA segments that are greater than 1,000 kilobase pairs. So they're in between the chromosomal abnormalities and the very much smaller sequence variants. So our DNA, right, is full of holes. There are lots and lots of deletions in our DNA. Also in our DNA, 
there are lots of duplications, so little chunks of DNA that are duplicated with each other. And so we've got tons of those copy number variants. So instead of, so if there's a duplication, for example, we all have two copies of a section of DNA, one from mother, one from father. If you have a duplication, you've got three copies of DNA. If you have a deletion, you only have one copy of DNA. Maybe you got left with mom's DNA, maybe you got left with dad's DNA. So that's what a copy number variant looks like. And there are lots, of, we have lots of them. Um, we're lucky because for the most part, those copy number variants don't disrupt the function of a gene. They're in a section of DNA that we used to call junk DNA. About 90% of our DNA was used to be referred to as junk DNA because there was no obvious function to that DNA. Now we're learning that actually that DNA does have a function, but it's quite subtle, and you can do without uh, a lot of uh, deletions or du duplications. Like the functions of the genes uh, aren't really affected. These copy number variants can be very rare. In other words, I can, one can arise spontaneously in me, or one can arise spontaneously in either of my parents and then transmit it to me. So when it arises spontaneously in me, that's a de novo variant. If it, arrives, if it arises in my mother or in my father, it's inherited. But since it's arised for the first time, it's very, very rare, right? So that's why when these uh, variations occur in one or two ger generations up or even three generations up, they tend to be rare genetic variants, copy number variants, as opposed to the benign copy number variants that we all have that are spread all the way through the population and have become common. So in the autism area, there's been a, a lot of discovery about these rare de novo copy number variants. So that is, they're arising in the individual with ASD. So in if this rare copy number variant um, overlaps uh, with a gene that has some function in the brain and it affects the function of that uh, particular gene, it could potentially lead to an autism spectrum disorder. So this slide illustrates uh, uh, what I think what I think is is that um, what looks like a copy number variant is that you can have on the one side you've got the normal chromosome um, you've got n the normal chromosome I'll just do it just to help myself orient you've got the normal chromosome uh, over here you can have a deleted chromosome uh, there's this little section right here that gets deleted so the chromosome shorter or you can have it duplicated and the chromosome then becomes longer. That's all copy number variants are, just duplications or deletions of long chunks of, uh, of DNA. So this is a slide uh, that's taken from uh, the one of our, uh, sort of our most recent genetic study that looked at uh, these rare copy number variants in kids with ASD. And, um, and on this slide, what we found was that about 7% of kids with ASD carry these rare copy number variants that are expressed in the brain and the location of the copy number variant is consistent with a, it disrupting the function of that particular gene. We found these rare de novo events. They're not seen in the parents, either parent, so it arises spontaneously in the kid with ASD in about 7% of kids with ASD compared to about 3% of normal controls. So point number one about resiliency is this concept of reduced penetrance. Those controls, although they have this, the risk gene, they don't have ASD. So there's something, it's called reduced penetrance, and there is something that is protecting those normal controls from developing ASD. So that's an example of reduced penetrance, which is an example of genetic resiliency. It may be all the other genes that you've got that protect you in some way. We don't know. The other interesting thing that we discovered in that study was that the genes that account for ASD 
the rare copy number variants that account for ASD also account for intellectual disability. There's really no difference between the genes that are associated with ASD and the genes that are associated with intellectual disability without ASD. And then other groups discovered same thing with schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia have the same genetic variants that people with ASD do that, and people with intellectual disability, as do people with, uh, with attention deficit disorder. So there's something common about these neurodevelopmental disorders, even though they may have a different expression over the lifespan. ASD, intellectual disability, schizophrenia, ADHD seem to share similar uh, uh, rare uh, de novo genetic variants. <coughs> now, it's been impossible to keep up with the number of genes that have been discovered that appear to be uh, uh, related to ASD, and I've just listed some genes here. Uh, the important point is, is that each one of these genetic variants are rare, and so they only account for less than 1% of kids with ASD. It's almost as if each kid with ASD not only looks like each kid with ASD, but they have their own private genetic mutation. It's not quite as bad as that, but it's like all the ASD kids carry private, their own version of a de novo genetic variant. Still only 7%, maybe upwards of 10% now, and there are now over 800 genes that have been identified to be affected by these rare de novo events that seem to be associated with autism spectrum disorder. So that's a little discouraging, 800 different genes. Uh, you know, like what does all that mean? It's a cornucopia of genetic effects. It doesn't really make for a consistent story. Well, actually, there is a good story for this. And that is, although there may be 800 genes, they coalesce into what are called common genetic networks. In other words, if you think of what are the functions of some of these genes in the brain, most of these genes participate in between, uh, in one to five different networks of, of genes. So in other words, there's many genes that have similar effects in the brain, and some genes have different effects in the brain. But it's like there's five or six maybe different clusters of genetic effects. So there could be 800 genes, but those 800 genes coalesce down into maybe five or six different networks of genes that have a similar function in the brain, any one of which could be affected by a copy number variant and then might lead to an autism spectrum disorder. And this is just a, an illustration for uh, the neuroscience nerds in the audience. There must be some neuroscience nerds in the OMA. Yeah? Um, uh, this is a synapse, and I think the really exciting thing is that all these genes appear to affect the synapse, which is the little cleft, the little space between where two neurons in the brain communicate with each other, right? So the two neurons in the brain, there's a little space between them, and an electrical impulse is released from one, and it goes to the other. Well, the amazing thing about these genetic effects is they all come down to the synapse. They all affect the extent to which the, these two neurons are able to communicate with each other in the brain. So we now know, we now have some, uh, uh, a much better idea of the biochemical and molecular pathways in the brain that seem to be associated with ASD. And this has now led to uh, a very intense discovery process of trying to find uh, medications that can affect the synaptic uh, uh, cleft in this way to compensate for what the genes are disrupting at the synapse. Okay, so uh, this is a little uh, complicated. Now, again, I wish I had my pointer, but um, if you, whoops, if you, uh, okay, let's go, let's go to, so this is a three generation pedigree, okay? Um, uh, this is the uh, great grandparents 
These are the grandparents. I'm going, starting from the top, the great-grandparents, then the grandparents, then the parents, and then the, the uh, fourth generation. So there's four generations here, okay? The, you can see the black circle with the arrow. That's the kid that I know, all right? I know that kid really, really well, um, and I followed him for many, many years, and he has classic Asperger's syndrome. He has classic autism spectrum uh, disorder. Uh, he has a, a deletion in a gene called the Shank 1 gene, uh, and he inherited that from his mother. His mother is completely unaffected. She's an absolutely lovely, charming person. She has been affected by anxiety, that is true, but otherwise she has no autism symptoms whatsoever. She inherited that deletion from her father. Now her father was a little odd. Her father was a truck driver. He didn't spend a lot of time at home. He had a, even when he was home, he spent a lot of time with his uh, stamp collection. He had an extensive stamp collection, not a very talkative person whatsoever. So, okay, he doesn't have autism, but one could make an argument that he is on the autism spectrum. The term we sort of use for individuals like that is that they have what's called the broader autism phenotype. They have a milder sub-threshold expression of the disorder. Now, the mother, who I said was unaffected, passed that deletion on to the boy that I know, but she also had a daughter and she passed that deletion on to the daughter. That daughter is completely typical as well. She has no symptoms of ASD whatsoever. But she has the deletion. Now, she's a little anxious, that's for sure, but she has no autism symptoms whatsoever. She passes that deletion on to three children. You can see on the left-hand side of the slide, Two of them, she, she passes it on to the two boys uh, in that family. Both of them have an autism spectrum disorder. The, she doesn't pass it on to the girl. She doesn't, she's not affected. So you can see in this particular pedigree, this is a very special pedigree. It's an example of a rare copy number variant that segregates through the family every boy who's affected I'm sorry, every boy who inherits the deletion is affected with the disorder. Every girl who inherits the deletion is unaffected but has an anxiety disorder or has an anxiety problem. So is it possible that anxiety in these families is a variable expression of the particular risk factor? But what is it that's protecting the women in this particular pedigree and not available to the boys in this particular pedigree so that they do become affected. We've got the risk factor, the shank deletion, but we have no clue about the protective factors that might be associated with what we call reduced penetrance in the girls or the girls being unaffected. So I've talked about the copy number variants. If we move more to the right, we then get those really tiny sequence variants that we detect by whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. And now there's been, uh, 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 in the la this is the last five years of research, and I won't go into detail with these slides, but you know what, it's the same story. There are rare de novo sequence variants that arise spontaneously in the kid with ASD. You, we don't see them in controls without a disorder. They appear in those same genes that affect the synapse in the same way that those copy number variants do. Um, uh, and, they, uh, and, th and that's where they end because for the most part, people with ASD who inherit the copy number variant don't have children, so the genetic variant stops there. There are some examples of both mothers and fathers in now what are we call trios. There are some examples of mothers and fathers where the mother or the father has the sequence variant. They're unaffected, 
they pass it on to uh, their children and the child now is affected with the disorder. So that's what we call reduced penetrance. I don't know what the phenotype is in these parents who carry these sequence variants because we haven't done that part of the data analysis now, but the same story is there, that there are these rare genetic variants that are inherited from one's parents. The parents are unaffected, I, either the mother, mother or the father, they pass it on to the children and the child becomes affected. So what is it, again, it's an example of a protective factor. There is something that's protecting the parents from the development of the disorder, but that when it goes through a transmission to the children, they become affected. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah, so, uh, no. So that, yes, I, uh, so that, you, that can happen. I don't think we've really discovered that side of the family very well, but one of the other things we're discovering is that once you start looking at really big families with multiply affected individuals, what you start to see is that there are new genetic variants that are coming in from different sides of the family from the mother's side of the family and from the father's side of the family. So these, gen these rare, although th each genetic variant by itself is rare, there are a lot of rare genetic variants and they're accumulating. And the more densely affected the pedigree, the family, the more it's coming in from both sides of the family. That's one of the things that we're finding that's, uh, that's uh, certainly puzzling. Okay, so that's an example of some resilience, some protective factors with respect to inherited genetic variants and the possibility that although some of these protective factors may not result in ASD, maybe they result in other phenotypes like anxiety problems. Just something to think about. Okay, I need to put my glasses on because I can't see the slide. Ah, good. So this is, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Canadian infant sibling study. Um, this is a study, Lonnie Zweigenbaum, the University of Alberta is the PI on this study. Susan Bryson uh, at IWK in Halifax is also the PI. I've been lucky to participate in the study uh, as well. So this is a study um, where kids with an older sibling with ASD are followed from birth to three years of age. Um, and uh, this is the Canadian study, one of the first one to get started, has 400 of these siblings. Imagine, it's a, an enormous sample size and about 160 comparison infants. So that is where there's, these are normal, typical babies that are followed to three years of age. They have no family history of ASD whatsoever. And in the baby sibling study, the kids are assessed at birth or as close to birth as you can get and then every six months to age 24 months and then again at 36 months. At 36 months, the, a diagnostic assessment is done on everybody, all 400 of the siblings and 160 controls to see which of them might have an autism spectrum disorder, okay? And that's where we got the statistic that 20% of that 400 cohort at three years of age had an autism spectrum disorder compared to, uh, I think there was only one kid of the 160 controls in the comparison group that had ASD. So uh, in this slide, what I'm showing you is their Mullen score. So it's a measure of their cognitive ability. And instead of dividing the kids by having a sibling with ASD and a control, what this does is take the, the, the longitudinal scores on their cognitive abilities and tries to find more homogeneous subgroups, okay? So mixing everybody together and finding out, okay, if you follow their cognitive development over time, how do they coalesce together into more homogeneous subgroups? So most of the typical kids 
okay? So the first thing to notice, everybody starts out the same, right? These, so these are their cognitive scores on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis is time. So if you start at the far left of that graph, that's their score at around six months of age, everybody's the same. What happens is, is that the kids become more heterogeneous with time. They become more and more differentiated. Most of the typically developing kids are in the top line. In other words, their cognitive scores start out at six months and then they have an upward trajectory showing that their cognitive scores are doing quite well. The red line and the green line are siblings of kids with ASD. Most of the ASD kids are in the green line. Most of the kids who are going to develop ASD are in the green line, but there are also some siblings in that green line who don't develop ASD but have these other developmental challenges. This is an example of their developmental challenges, but the red line is a hodgepodge of typically developing kids, kids who are going to have autism, and some of those other siblings. In other words, there is, a, there is an increasing heterogeneity in the developmental trajectories of siblings with ASD. So there is something, there is some protective factors that's moving kids potentially from the green trajectory into the red trajectory and into the blue trajectory. Otherwise, if it was homogeneous, right, then we'd have two, uh, two distinct groups, whereas we've got much more heterogeneity than that and quite distinct uh, developmental trajectories. So something's influencing the unfolding of their cognitive development over time. Some risk factor is pushing kids down into the green line, but some protective factor is rescuing kids to put them into the blue and into the red line. Now I'm going to talk about the <coughs> pathways in ASD study. This is a longitudinal study that we've been doing uh, uh, and that's been funded largely by CIHR but also by Autism Speaks, the uh, Government of British Columbia, the uh, Autism Innovation, the Alberta, sorry, Innovation Fund, the Seneev Family Foundation, uh, um, Neuro DevNet, uh, the Autism Research Training Program. So we've had a lot of sponsors. The study's been going on uh, since the early 2000. So 2004 actually is when we started the study. The objective of the pathway study is to investigate the <laughs> developmental course of uh, children with ASD from the preschool years to adolescence. And we we're lucky enough to just get uh, funding in the latest round of CIHR, so we're going to be able to follow these kids to at least 18 years of age, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to follow them into young adulthood um, as well. And the whole focus of the project is really was at the very beginning to identify the factors that promote a good outcome in ASD. Uh, we never used the word resilience in the days, in the early 2000s when we were designing the study, but that's really, in retrospect, what we were trying to do. And actually, I'm going to emphasize that this study question didn't come from the investigators, it came from stakeholders. So we had a conference, much like this, where we brought together parents, uh, policymakers, clinicians, uh, who work with kids with ASD, and we asked them to tell us what the most important question was that they wanted an answer to. This was uh, back in early 2000, uh, one, two, three, something like that. And uh, uh, we gave them Monopoly money. We said we gave them $100 of Monopoly money. Here's 10 questions that you've identified as interesting. Put your money on the question that you think is most important. And the question that garnered the most funds uh, was this question about factors that promote a good outcome. Interestingly enough, it wasn't the question that we thought we would study, the scientists, the investigators. Uh, we thought they'd propose to us a different question, but we went with this question and we're glad we did. It was the, it was the right question. Uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit of data from the study, um, and I'm just going to uh, look at the 
developmental course of symptom severity and adaptive functioning in preschool children with ASD. So symptoms, right, uh, you know, are autism symptoms. And actually, Sam is a, a great example of the distinction that I would really like us to think about between symptoms and adaptive functioning. He's got a lot of symptoms. Sam, he's rocking, he doesn't, you know, still his eye contact, his voice, those are a lot of autism symptoms, but his adaptive functioning by working in the barista, et cetera, is actually pretty good. And the whole purpose of this analysis is to show that symptoms and functioning don't go together. So the whole concept that there's something called higher functioning autism or lower functioning autism makes absolutely no sense because it's too, it's more complicated uh, than that. Uh, so this is the, this is the largest follow-up study of kids with ASD anywhere in the world. We've got about 400 kids. They were sampled from Halifax, Montreal, Hamilton, Vancouver, and Edmonton. Um, we got the kids about a month after they were given, or a yeah, about a month or so after they were first given a diagnosis of ASD um, at about uh, 39 months of age. The age of diagnosis was 38 months of age. They enrolled in a study on average at 39 months of age. Um, and, you know, th they're, they're a pretty representative sample of kids with ASD. I will mention that the parents first become, this is how Canada's doing with respect to early recognition of ASD. Parents first became concerned about the development of their kids at around 18 months of age, but they're not getting a diagnosis until 39 months of age, 38 months of age. So that's 20 months of a diagnostic odyssey of trying to go from, I have a worry about my kid's development to actually getting a diagnosis. So not very good for Canada. We did the same thing as uh, showed in that um, cognitive um, slide from the baby sibling study was that instead of us predetermining developmental course over time, we let the data speak for itself. So let's look at data over time in their symptoms, their autism symptoms, and in their adaptive functioning, and what are the homogeneous subgroups that emerge? Can we identify more homogeneous subgroups of different developmental trajectories in autism symptoms and in adaptive functioning? And more importantly, what's the overlap between their trajectory in adaptive functioning and their trajectories in um, uh, symptom severity? So this is what symptom severity looks like. Kids are three years when we start. They're going into grade one when we end. And we're using here the ADOS score over time. And if we just let the data speak for itself and build a model that best represents the data, we see that there are two trajectories of symptom uh, severity over time. The red line, the flat line, is most kids with ASD. Their symptom severity is pretty stable over time. There is another group, the blue group, 15, 10 to 15% of the kids, who are pretty similar at the beginning, but they experience a relatively rapid drop in their symptom severity by the time they get into grade one. Okay, so there, this is a group that is losing a lot of symptoms in a relatively short period of time. It's not a lot of kids, but it's very encouraging to see that there's a significant subgroup of kids that are rapidly improving in their autism symptoms um, over time. Some of the kids at the end no longer fulfill the criteria for ASD. I know you're gonna ask me what services did they receive just about everybody received services or receiving some kind of service at the beginning. It's a hodgepodge of services. There's no rhyme or reason uh, between the services that they receive and the outcome of the kids when it comes to adaptive functioning. Sorry, symptom severity. So this is the trajectory of, of adaptive functioning. 
and it's a little more complex. So for adaptive functioning between the point of diagnosis till th three years of age, we have three developmental trajectories that appear. <coughs> so kids with adaptive functioning, so this ref adaptive functioning, remember, refers to their social, it's a composite measure of their social skills, their communication skills, their daily living skills. It's how they're doing in the world. It's a measure of their functioning, of their impairment, as it were. And if we look at the left-hand side, everybody's just about the same at the beginning, but there's this fanning out of developmental trajectories in adaptive functioning over time. It looks like there's three pathways that kids follow over time. There's the blue group who are lower at the beginning and the, s the slope is negative a little bit and their adaptive functioning looks like it's going down over time. There's the red group who starts out flat and then has a slight inclination and then there's the green group that has a rapid improvement and then kind of flattens out after that. So, uh, so there's again about 20% of the kids are what we call high and improving. They start out with better adaptive functioning and their adaptive functioning is improving over time. That's about 20% of the sample. Remember, these are very young kids with ASD at three years of age and at the end of, uh, at the end of grade one. Now, um, the bottom line here is that different kids with ASD follow different developmental trajectories in autism symptom severity and adaptive functioning. And I'm emphasizing the fanning out of their trajectories over time. There's an increasing heterogeneity amongst kids with ASD. They start out the same, more or less similar, and they become less and less similar as time goes on. But the striking thing was is that there is virtually no overlap between the kids that are in the improving their symptom severity trajectory and the adaptive functioning trajectory. Those are different groups of kids altogether. The degree of overlap between the two symptom severity and the three adaptive functioning trajectories is virtually nil. It's 0.13, which uh, is very, very low. So the bottom line is you can have a lot of autism symptoms but be in a high functioning category, right? You can be uh, in a, in a uh, uh, you can have few autistic symptoms and be in a lower functioning category. So there are all kinds of potential combinations between symptoms and adaptive functioning. A kid can be with ASD can be resilient in one domain but not be resilient in another domain. <clears throat> and you know what? The same pattern begins to appear if we start to look at other phenotypes like language and like socialization. So this is a, a trajectory from another study using a similar method looking at socialization trajectories from three years of age to 14 years of age. So the point of this slide is, is that the longer you go out in time, the more heterogeneous the different trajectories are, uh, in, uh, at least in this case, in socialization. And there's some really wild patterns here. I mean, there's some kids that start out really low with really poor socialization skills and make rapid improvements in their social skills over time. Uh, there's other kids that start out at the top and kind of stay at the top but there's a lot of variability. So the point I want to make is the extraordinary heterogeneity in change over time with respect to these kids. So I'm gonna end now with some, just a, a discussion about resilient developmental health outcomes. I'm gonna come back, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> to developmental health and looking at development and resilient developmental health outcomes. There's quite a bit of follow-up literature in ASD <coughs> and studies following kids with ASD to adulthood. And the sort of rough estimate 
is that about 10% of kids with ASD will have a, quote, good outcome, meaning they're living independently, they have relationships, um, uh, uh, a minimal of autism symptoms. And there's this emerging literature in what's called optimal outcomes in ASD. Uh, and Debbie Fine, who's been doing a lot of this work, defines optimal outcome by not meeting criteria for ASD anymore and scoring above certain cutoffs on scores on socialization uh, and communication. So I, while I think this, uh, this literature is kind of interesting, there's a very important uh, policy point here, and that is, like, actually, what is an optimal outcome, and who has the right to define an optimal outcome? In Debbie Fine's literature, uh, the scientists defined what an optimal outcome might be. Well, is that what parents would define as an optimal outcome? What about people with ASD? What would they define as an optimal outcome? What would Sam define as an optimal outcome? Usually, optimal outcome uh, is defined in terms of their IQ, so they're scoring in the normal range and their IQ tests. They don't have any symptoms. They're scoring in the typical range on their socialization and communication scores using the same instrument that we use. No mental health problems, school achievement, uh, placement, etc. But again, I want to emphasize that there's a value-laden implication with respect to the definition of an optimal outcome, and uh, this is a discussion that I think we need to have. So uh, we sort of started to, to begin this, and we uh, asked parents to define resilient outcomes in their, these developmental health parameters, and, and parents said to us that you know, de the, the developmental health outcomes to pay attention to are uh, mental health, adaptive functioning, independence, and physical health. They did not say anything about IQ. They didn't say anything about autism symptoms. And again, I thought that was very, very interesting. So I want to show you, we have data on mental health and these uh, aspects and adaptive functioning. We don't have data uh, in this cycle, the one I'm going to show you on independence uh, or on physical health, but we're collecting that. The kids are too young for the data that we've got in order to show data on independence, and uh, the physical health data isn't uh, cleaned up yet. Okay, so I guess uh, it's probably not easy for you to see it on the slides, but you've got it on, the, on your paper. <coughs> and this is time two, time four, and time six. So these are when the kids are four years of age, six years of age, and eight years of age. And we're looking at the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale on their getting a score above 77, which Debbie Fine would call an optimal outcome. A score on daily living above 77, again, Debbie Fine would call that optimal. A score on their social skills above 77. And you've got the percentages of kids at four, six, and eight years of age who score in the optimal range on those particular parameters. <coughs> you, you've got the CBCL, the internalizing uh, domain. So internalizing are measures of anxiety and depression. Externalizing are measures of ADHD, disruptive behavior, oppositional defiant disorder. 50 is the average score on the CBCL. If you score less than 50, uh, <coughs> you're you know, less than the average uh, compared to typically developing children. So, so that's the absence of uh, internalizing problems and externalizing problems. So what I'm struck by is the prevalence of this is actually there's a lot of kids who are what Debbie Fine calls in the optimal outcome, what I would prefer to call a resilient outcome, at these different developmental time points with respect to their adaptive functioning. And there's actually a lot of kids uh, who um, are scoring in the optimal outcome or don't have, are below average for their uh, internalizing and externalizing symptoms. The Wyatt is a score of educational achievement, 
Uh, again, is that above 77? That's in the optimal range. So like 72% of the sample at eight years of age are uh, scoring in the typical range when it comes to educational achievement. So I, t I take away two points from this. One, there's a lot of resilience in this population. It's not the same kids over time, and it's not the same kids by their domain. You can be resilient in one domain, like your socialization, and then you may lose it two years later. You may fall below the cutoff two years later. You may get it back four years later. It's not a stable characteristic. And neither is it domain specific. It doesn't cover everything. You can be resilient in adaptive functioning and not resilient when it comes to mental health or vice versa. So resilience is not a trait. It's not a stable trait, which means it's actually a fluid concept, which means it's modifiable, which means you can do something about it. And I think that really becomes a really important point, is that if we can identify the factors that are associated with the variation in these optimal outcomes, both over time and between different domains, that that would be a very important bit of knowledge uh, for us to have. So resi resilience in, in, in ASD can depend on the developmental health outcome that you're looking at, whether it's mental health or socialization. It can vary by your developmental stage. It can happen at multiple levels of analysis. I've illustrated genetic resiliency all the way to psychosocial resiliency. The key point that I think is really uh, important is that it can be completely independent of autism symptoms and occur, can occur at any level of functioning or IQ. Why can't a person with intellectual disability in ASD also be resilient? No reason not to. They can be resilient, certainly with respect to their mental health, for sure. <coughs> and then the key message, really, is that the factors that promote resiliency, other than being female, are completely unknown to us in the field. Uh, and uh, um, I think that is something really to contemplate and to think about. So I'm just going to conclude by saying that the developmental health of each individual is the result of this complex interaction between risk and protective factors. And this interaction occurs at several levels, from the molecular level to the individual level to the contextual level. And virtually all of our research in the ASD field has been focused on risk factors. We know a lot about risk factors. And protective factors are not simply the absence of risk factors. Protective factors can be something entirely different. And uh, resilience, therefore, is not simply an absence of risk. Resilience is the presence of protective factors. And although we don't know what those protective factors are, I'm convinced that by focusing on protective factors, that that will have a much greater translational impact in our research than our traditional focus, which has been on risk factors. I think our focus on risk factors has been useful and important, but I don't think it's enough. I think we have to complement that now with a much greater focus on what some of these protective factors might be. So I need to acknowledge my good friend and colleague, Steve Shearer, uh, uh, who I've worked with for many years on our genetic studies and our funding from the Genome Canada team. Uh, acknowledge uh, Lonnie Zweigenbaum and Susan Bryson and all the members of the Canadian Baby Sibs study team, which I've uh, had the pleasure to be part of. The Pathways team has been the joy of my scientific life. I've really enjoyed that team and working with them. They've been absolutely great. The funding agencies, for the most part, have been supportive, but not <laughs> always. Um, but the families and the kids that we've got to know uh, over time. And doing these longitudinal studies is such a treat because you do get to know these families over an extended period of time, and that's been uh, very informative and uh, important to us. So I'll end there, and I think, do we have time for questions or? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yes.
Yeah, we have time for questions, but I'm going to ask you to do the same as we did for uh, Dr. Volkmar. Write your questions down on a card. <coughs> we're going to have people go around and collect them, and then we'll put them forward. While we're waiting for the first one, I'm going to ask the first question, though, which is there's a lot of studies about resilience in things like, as you mentioned, disasters, but also divorce, chronic illness in children. Uh, and I'm just wondering if, if those same resilient factors, if you're looking at them in terms of, of ASD. Yeah, so I think that's a, uh, that is a great point. There is quite a literature on resilience in other conditions, and uh, some of those protective factors may in fact be relevant. And so we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at them. We have to contextualize them in the context of the ASD literature, uh, but certainly that'll be something that we'll, we'll have a look at. And I hope other colleagues in the field will start to look at some of those as well. So girls outnumber boys four to one no, in clinic samples. No, I made a mistake. Boys outnumber girls in uh, clinic samples four to one. I made a mistake, sorry. So boys outnumber girls four to one in clinic samples. The sex ratio become smaller, boys outnumber girls two to one uh, in the epidemiologic studies, so that's different. Yes, apologies. What is your best guess as to what are the important protective factors for ASD? So, uh, so my best guess um, is, I think we know, pr I think we can guess, have a good guess at some of the um, uh, factors that are individual, let me call them individual level factors, um, and I think they might be things like early on joint attention, um, you know, easy temperament, those might be uh, important early uh, protective factors. Uh, as time goes on, my feeling is, my guess is, that the importance of individual protective factors diminish and the importance of contextual factors increase. So it is astonishing to me about informant differences, for example, with respect, if you ask teachers and parents about the prevalence of mental health problems in the kids. So are there teachers in the audience? So, so what, ha what happens in our study is that we ask parents and teachers to report on mental health problems in the kids. And uh, we haven't looked at this in real detail, but the prevalence of mental health problems in school is very much higher than the prevalence of mental health problems in the kids according to parents. So there are real informant differences with respect to mental health. Now in the, in the, the typical child development field, we knew that, we've known that for decades that parents and teachers disagree about the presence or absence of a mental health problem in a child or an adolescent. Nobody's looked at this with respect to ASD kids. And you know what, it's my, it's my, uh, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it really uh, is astonishing to me how little we have paid attention to the contextual and environmental factors that we know have a huge impact on the development of typically developing kids and have ignored it virtually completely in, as ASD researchers. And that goes for you too, Fred, wherever you are. He's my good friend, I can, I can say that about Fred Volkmar. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so mental health problems are much more common in schools and to me, you know, that has a lot to do with the concept of accommodation. And uh, so a really important protective factor I is building accommodating environments. And uh, I think as one gets older, accommodating environments become more and more important. And I think we need to, in our interventions, as time goes on, ignore symptoms and build accommodating environments like the Starbucks, which is an accommodating environment. It's a fantastic example. And we need to figure out how to do that in other contexts uh, as well. What is the evidence that early diagnosis, 18 months versus 36 months, makes a difference in outcome? You know what, you're absolutely right. There is no evidence of a randomized control trial 
showing that if you randomly assign kids to get a diagnosis at 18 months, they have a better outcome than kids who are uh, given a diagnosis at 36 months. So that part we don't know. I think, uh, and it is fair to say, if you provide a diagnosis at 18 months, that's going to be way more expensive than providing a diagnosis at 36 months because you've got 18 months now of intervention, but potentially, that you didn't have before. So I totally agree with you that we don't really know the, that uh, giving a, a diagnosis at that early age. I will say, however, that um, uh, uh, what I find interesting in this is that the most important predictor of our pathways data, the most important predictor of our pathways data was where they started off. So where the kids started in their developmental trajectory, whatever domain it looked like, that was the most important predictor of where they ended up going into grade one. So it was the baseline that really drove the trajectory. And the worrisome thing there is that that's the point at which they got the diagnosis. It may be that that's already too late. Maybe we should be providing much more structured but generic interventions for kids prior to the point of diagnosis so that diagnosis doesn't become the gatekeeper to the intervention but that everybody gets some kind of intervention even though they may not develop ASD at all but that they get a more intense nonspecific developmentally sensitive intervention prior to the diagnosis so we make sure that those baseline differences are minimized as much as possible. Are there a lot of other longitudinal studies, especially with genetic studies? No, there aren't a lot. Uh, there isn't, I don't know of a single uh, <coughs> study that is longitudinal that also has genetic uh, work. So all the kids in our study have had their exome sequenced, uh, had their genome sequenced. So we're going to be able to look at the extent to which genetic factors might influence their developmental trajectory. So that'll be quite interesting. The whole area of longitudinal studies in ASD has kind of fallen by the wayside in the last couple of years. There's not as much of it. Um, and I think that's a pity because I think there's a whole set of new questions that we should be looking at. But it is good to see that there's more intervention studies. So, so that's good. I know. I, got, I have to put that one at the bottom, right? Just to be fair. Okay, how do you translate the information from the pathway study to discussions with parents of newly diagnosed children with ASD? What do you tell them uh, when they ask what the future holds? That's a great question. So uh, what I tell them is that, um, uh, um, that I don't really know uh, what the future holds, um, but that different kids follow different pathways over time. Uh, and that virtually everybody gets better. This is the great thing about working in the ASD field. Uh, the virtually everybody gets better over time. Remember, those are standard scores that I showed with their adaptive functioning, not raw scores. So if you're flat or even going down a teeny weeny little bit uh, in your trajectory on adaptive functioning, you're actually increasing your raw scores in adaptive functioning over time, right? Because it's not standardized for age. So I say I don't really know, uh, and I also say that um, uh, everybody gets better over time. I say there are going to be ups and downs. There may be improvements in some areas, and there may be worries in other areas. So you just have to be prepared for that. Things may go well at one time, one point, then there may come a transition and things should be difficult. So anticipate that. And then I make the point about um, the importance of um, quality of life and happiness, you know, and that we really need to pay attention to that in the end because, as I've seen with Sam and as I've seen with so many adults with ASD, there can be a lot of symptoms, there can even be a lot of impairment and low functioning but there can be a very high quality of life 
and there can be happiness given the right accommodation, given the right contextual um, environment. And that my job with you as parents is to try and find the context and the environment and the situation that's the most accommodating and helpful and supportive uh, in the circumstances. Do you anticipate, through further analysis of the data, from the older participants, the adolescents and young adults, that trajectories will deteriorate on average or at least change, uh, puberty, increasing social demands, and bullying, et cetera? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh, I think there will be more heterogeneity as time goes on. But I don't think anything is written in stone. There's no, there's no concreteness, right? These are not um, inevitable <coughs> pathways. Kids can jump from one pathway to another given the circumstances. We saw this, I didn't show data from my other study of autism and, uh, and uh, Asperger's syndrome where there was a lot of back and forth over time in terms of their developmental um, trajectories. So, and I don't believe that puberty and hormones are the thing that drive any kind of regression in, in, uh, in early adolescence. How can we reassess parents, reassure parents, read genetics, i.e., to, yeah, yeah, to not repeat the blame the parents all over again? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Um, and, you know, the, the way to do it is to say, well, it happens, it happened in, your sp in the sperm or in the egg. It had nothing to do with, it's a completely chance event. Um, and no, there's no agency to it whatsoever. Uh, you know, it was a chance event. It happened, nothing you did. It happened in the sperm, it happened in the egg, and that's sort of uh, the way it was. The tricky one is if there's conflict between mom and dad, and it's inherited from dad, say, Right, and then the mom says, "Oh, I comes from your side of the family. I, I knew it all along, kind of thing." <laughs> so, you have to be sensitive to, to this. And you know what? I think genetic counseling, as we uncover more and more of these genetic variants, I think genetic counseling will become more and more an important part of the uh, workup of kids with ASD. So everybody with ASD should have clinical microarrays done. That's now standard first-line testing to uncover these copy number uh, variants. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if within the next decade, even shorter, whole genome sequencing should be the first line of testing to uncover the genetic variants. Uh, and I think the demand for genetic counseling is going to get even uh, bigger. Yeah. Uh, right, so is it, so I talked about all the genetic variants, and is it possible that our increasingly toxic environment uh, is responsible for this? Epi so bringing up the topic of epigenetics. So, yeah, I mean, epigenetics is, uh, is a very interesting field. Um, epigenetics has uncovered a lot in animal models, none of it related so far to um, ASD. Um, it's very difficult to study the impact of epigenetic factors in humans because you need to get the brain in order to study those epigenetic factors in the brain. And that's very hard and very difficult to do. So, uh, so I think there is, a there is a story out there about pollutants, particularly in California, particularly among migrant workers came out a couple of years ago. I haven't seen uh, much uh, newer work on it, but it is something to sort of pay attention to, that's for sure. But I don't think there's anything translational at this point, nothing to, uh, uh, you know, change policy on. Yeah, what are the, so based on protective model, what are the protective service factors for adolescents and adults? So one thing is to reduce a focus on symptoms. Uh, I think that's, you know, autism symptoms. I think that's, uh, that should not be a focus of our interventions. And there are interventions that do focus on reducing symptoms. And my argument would be 
that's not the target. The target really is functioning, and, we sh and functioning should be seen as the result of an individual and the environment that he, and she, he or she is in, and so the services need to work not only with the individual to teach skills and to teach protective factors, but also need to work with the environment, school, home, setting, job, to also be more accommodating um, over time. From a, uh, for a male patient whose sister and potential grandfather both have Asperger type ASD, is there any genetic testing available for him and his wife prior to conception? Yeah, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can, re you can request if you're, if the individual is affected with ASD, they can request genetic testing to see if there is a genetic variant that might be associated with uh, disorder. People are doing that now. Okay, quick, one more. Okay. I'm trying to find one that's slightly, uh, Uh, you know what? I've answered all these, I think, to a bit. So, so I'll uh, I'll stop there. So I want to thank Dr. Sutsmary for a very stimulating talk, especially to bring to the attention of everybody in the room about uh, resiliency pet factors. I think it's certainly something that we that he's absolutely right about. We need to start thinking about that, and so I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much.